Vision. It's great to see you all on this beautiful uh, fall morning, right? You know, it's not scorching hot anymore. We praise God. Uh, before we get into our worship time, I'd like to draw your attention to some announcements that are on the screen behind me, hopefully. Great. Um, first, uh, new members class is coming up on Saturday, October 16th from 9 to 5. It is a big chunk of time, but uh, we try to do that so that we don't eat up multiple weekends uh, for you. But if you're new, um, you want to just sort of learn a little bit more about what we believe and who we are and what we're about, please do sign up to come uh, and learn. And if you're interested in joining our church, uh, please email uh, Dr. Silvernail and we'll get that membership process started. Um, also, Women's Retreat is coming up. Uh, please send uh, your uh, registration to uh, Andrea Pagani. And then also, uh, community groups are starting up. We have, I think, about 50% of our folks in 60. Okay, we're about 60%. We would love for that percentage to be higher because community groups are such an important part of uh, the way in which we minister to you. Uh, a lot of our, the ways in which we support uh, all of you start with our, our community groups, and so we would love for you to be a part of them. Uh, if you need accommodations, such as Zoom or stuff like that, we've got a wide variety of groups in, in the ways that they're meeting so that you can, uh, there are really no excuses for you all to not be in a, in a community group, and so we would love for uh, you all to, to sign up for that. Now, let us turn our attention to worship. And we do so by calling ourselves to worship, uh, by reading from 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 7, and verses 22 to 26. I'll be reading the leader. You'll be reading uh, the people, uh, which should be in bold behind me. You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses and trust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits, since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. An athlete is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. It is the hardworking farmer who ought to have the first share of the crops. Think over what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. So flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. Have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know that they breed quarrels. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents. God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. Let us pray. Father, we do come today as we thank you that you treat us not like enemies, but you endure our sins with patient endurance, that you do not give up on us, but you, send your, you sent your son to die for us, that we might have life in him, that you would open our eyes and transform us by the power of your Holy Spirit. And so, Lord, we ask that you do that today, that uh, those of us that don't know you would come to know you, and those of us that do know you would be renewed and refreshed in you. Lord, would our prayers, our praise, and our hearing of your word give you glory and praise and honor. Lord, we ask that you would be with us now in this time as we worship. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please stand and continue to join us in worship, singing the new song we taught you two weeks ago. Build now my life, O Lord, my God, in every part we pray. That my whole being may proclaim thy being and thy ways. Not for the lips of praise alone, not even praising heart, I ask but 
responsibly at first, and then I'll be praying pastorally. Um, as we often do, we are praying uh, together corporately uh, for things that are sort of societal level, uh, sort of big picture, nation, society, world kind of things, kingdom kind of things. 
And then um, this morning as we're praying, I want to sort of bring our focus back to the local church. And I'll pray from up here together for our, our covenant children and our families. Oftentimes we don't talk about uh, the little ones in our midst up here from the pulpit. We don't necessarily sort of spend a lot of time sort of talking about and praying for our children. Um, we tend to do that in more intimate settings uh, during, for instance, Lord's Supper back before the pandemic or in our um, various programs. But I want us as a church to be praying together for our children because that's one of our vows, right? Uh, when we baptize our children, we vow as a congregation to support parents in the nurture and admonition of uh, the raising of our children. And so uh, let us turn to the Lord in prayer, starting um, with the words behind me on, on the screen. We'll be, you will be reading aloud the words in bold. So let's start by reading scripture, which is always a good place to start. Reading from Jude, um, verses 3, 18, and 21. Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. They said to you, in the last time there will be scoffers following their ungodly passions. It is these who cause divisions, worldly people devoid of the spirit. But you, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, Keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. Sovereign God, we pray on behalf of your church throughout the world for this congregation and for those who serve us within the Presbyterian Church in America. Today we pray specifically for our sister PCA churches in Northern Virginia. Fill them with your Holy Spirit and bless the worship services in person and online of Harvester PCA in Springfield, Virginia, and their pastors, Reverend Mark Hayes and Reverend Dan Dahl, and Crossroads PCA in Woodbridge, their new pastor, Reverend Alex Young. Lord, who answers our prayers, hear this one. O oh Lord, our God, in accordance with Philippians 1, verses 27 and th uh, through 30, our text for today, we thank you for the calling you have put upon our lives through the gift of Jesus Christ. We thank you for your church. We pray that you would bless your people everywhere with the truth of the gospel. We pray that this good news would be powerful for salvation through the gift of faith. Lord, who is faithful and true, hear our prayer. Loving Lord, be pleased to grant our nation social, educational, and economic progress that is pleasing in your sight. Gracious God, with all the instability and insufficiency in this world, we ask you to guide the nations of the earth into the way of justice and truth, establishing among them that peace which is fruit of righteousness, and bring them to you and your neighbors. Lord, Savior and Spirit, hear our prayer. Would you pray with me? Lord, we lift up our covenant children to you today. Lord, we lift up those that would like to have covenant children, um, those that are trying and struggling with infertility. We ask that you would comfort them and be with them as they persevere and trust in you. We ask that you would give them the desire of their hearts to be parents. And Lord, for those that are expecting, Lord, for Julie Blake, who is in the hospital right now, Lord, we pray that you would give her peace and comfort, that uh, you will, we pray that you will protect um, her baby, and that uh, we would rejoice when we get to meet this little one. Lord, even now we ask that you would be working in that little one's heart um, to work faith. And Lord, as we wait, we pray that you would be with Nathaniel and Eleanor and Julie as they uh, wait with anxious anticipation and with concern. Lord, we pray that you would give the doctors wisdom um, as they try to sort out what's going on and that you would protect everyone, uh, we pray. 
Lord, we pray for Marie Adkins. We pray that um, her baby would grow strong and in the faith. And we ask that you would prepare Bill and Marie for parenthood, that you would uh, give them strength um, as they prepare and uh, peace and comfort as they await uh, the arrival of this little one that you have blessed them with. Lord, we rejoice with them over uh, this baby and we pray that we would come alongside of them and uh, help them uh, nurture this little one in the faith. Lord, we pray even now that uh, these two little ones, these two babies, would come to know you and would never know a day where they did not rejoice in being yours. Uh, work faith in them, we pray. Lord, for our uh, littlest of children, we pray that they would continue to grow strong and healthy. And even now, as they hear the gospel, uh, just sort of as they play, we pray that they would be good soil for the seeds of faith that are being planted. Lord, we ask that those seeds would flower into a harvest that is a hundredfold, that uh, you would be uh, glorified in them. Lord, we pray that uh, for the kids that are just a little bit older than the littlest of, uh, uh, of our children, that they would grow to love the Lord and that they would never know a day without you and that their youthful joy of being at church with their friends and with, the ch with their community, their brothers and sisters in Christ would never waver, that they would rejoice in being counted among uh, the, the number of your kingdom. Lord, we pray for parents. It is a frustrating, exhausting, and difficult calling that you have given to us that are parents. Lord, we are uh, mindful that our children are sinful. Give us eyes to see as you, as you see in the midst of meltdowns, in the midst of late nights, in the midst of middle of the night wake ups. Lord, would you remind us that we were just like these children, um, needy and, uh, and sinful. Lord, give us grace for when we fail. Remind us that our children aren't, our, aren't in our hands ultimately, but are in yours. Lord, give us a confidence that, uh, in knowing that you are with us in this hard thing that we're doing. Give us encouragement and grace, we pray. Lord, we pray for all the programs that serve our children at Potomac Hills. Lord, we pray for the nursery, for uh, Katie Mextrath, who coordinates it, and all the volunteers. Lord, we thank you so much for these people that um, serve our, our littlest of children, that um, comfort them and nurture them and read books to them and play with them and are joyful as they interact. Lord, we pray that um, our children that are in the nursery would feel the love of your church for them, that they would feel your love through our volunteers. Lord, we pray that um, you would help us, that you would keep us from being burned out, um, from serving in the nursery and from serving in, in the various children's ministries, that we would rejoice in being able to uh, love those that you love. Lord, for Children's Church, we pray that our three to six-year-olds would learn to love the church and your gospel, that they would learn um, about the faith. We pray for all the teachers, that they would set forth your gospel in a way that would help faith to flower through the power of the Holy Spirit. Lord, we ask that you would be with Sarah Wong as she plans and prepares material and, uh, materials and curricula. Lord, be with the volunteers as they serve faithfully each month. Keep them from burnout and um, fill them with a joy that surpasses understanding. We ask that you would um, give them extra measures of your spirit and your grace as they serve. Lord, for Children's Sunday School, we pray for Courtney Stein as she continues to coordinate and help organize all of our children's ministries, thank you for her wisdom and her tireless uh, service to the, to the kingdom and to us. Lord, we pray for uh, the, t the Sunday school teachers, that they would have wisdom and joy as they teach. Would your gospel be presented faithfully and with power to the hearts of our covenant children? Lord, for the youth group, Lord, thank you for our youth. Thank you for such a wonderful group of students. Lord, thank you for the volunteers that help, for Chris Essex and Deb Williams and all the parents that uh, come through to help um, build relationships and point students to the gospel. Lord, thank you for this, the sixth graders that have come up um, just recently and are transitioning into the youth group. Thank you for a great Mojnik experience last week. Lord, thank you for the work that your Holy Spirit has done in hearts even now. 
Lord, we pray that those, uh, these sixth graders would transition well, that they would form relationships, and that we would see them grow comfortable, that they might hear your gospel and grow in the faith. And Lord, as these teens grow, we pray that they would uh, be rooted and grounded in the gospel, that they would become solid in um, claiming this, these gospel promises in you as their own, that they would be uh, firm in their foundation before they head out to college or wherever they're going. Lord, be with them, grow them. And Lord, as we, as a, as a congregation, we as a church come to your word, we ask that you would fill us and encourage us, that we, would be here, we are going to hear the words of life. For Lord, that is what your word is. Would we drink deeply from uh, your scriptures? And we ask that you would work mightily through Timo as he presents the gospel to us. Lord, thank you for your word, for your gospel, and most of all, for your son. Lord, it is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. And now we turn to a time of confession of sin and assurance of pardon. We will uh, read the words behind me together. Uh, you'll be reading the bold. Um, and then we're going to have a, a time of silent confession. And then uh, I'll, I'll bring us to that assurance of pardon. So confess with me these words. Our Father. Sins out of the dark and into your light. We have not worshipped you as we ought, nor sought after you. We have not seen evil for what it is, downplaying our offenses and refusing to repent. You are zealous to reconcile all things to yourself, yet we feel too at home in a broken world. You grant us spontaneous opportunities to love our neighbor, but oftentimes we ignore this. Jesus, our light has come, but we often choose to ignore the light and walk in shadows. O oh Lord, forgive us our sins through Jesus. Remove from us the veil of darkness that shrouds our lives. Fill our hearts with the hope of his return. Amen. Amen. And let us hear an assurance of pardon that we know with full confidence that we have been saved. From Galatians 5, verse 1. For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Now is the time for us to continue to worship through tithes and offerings. You can give uh, both online and in the offering bins on uh, at the exits as well. So let us sing together and give uh, in worship. Please stand and join us.
Children's Church, ages three through six, to come on down. Slowly and walk, please. Good job walking, everybody. Some good marching. sign to them 
of their destruction, but of your salvation, and that from God. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake, engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had, and now here that I still have. The word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for giving us your word. Thank you that it speaks of what you've done for us and what you call us to do. We pray this morning that you would fill us with your spirit so that we may understand and so that we, we may embrace what your word says and so that we will put it in practice. We pray that you would be with us this morning as we hear and respond. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, in the year 2000, a poster was discovered in a bookstore in Onwick, a small market town in the north of England. The poster had a simple design, had a red background, a Tudor crown on the top, and a motivational message below. The poster had been produced by the British government on the eve of World War II with the purpose of raising the morale of the British public as it faced threats of mass air attacks by Germany. Although more than two million copies were printed, the poster was little known until it was discovered more than 60 years later. More copies have been discovered since then, and this poster has, has been reissued, reissued um, by several private companies and it has become widely recognized around the world. Anyone know what was written on the poster? Keep calm and carrying on. Well, today we find this theme and motto on a variety of products, mugs, t-shirts, and gas posters. And though uh, few of us know much or anything at all about its origin, we still associate it with the British way of being, a sort of stoicism, uh, a determination to remain calm, whatever happens. Keep calm and carry on. Well, stoicism is not quite a biblical value, uh, and the Apostle Paul was not British, and he wasn't alive in, in the late 1930s, but he had a similar message to the Philippians at the end of chapter 1. As we've seen in the last few weeks, Paul writes this letter from prison, likely Rome, where he's been put for his proclamation of the gospel. He writes to the church in Philippi, a church that he had himself founded, to remind this church of his affection for them, of his prayers for them, to thank them for their concern for him, and to encourage them in the faith. And as we saw last week, Paul expects to be released from prison and see the Philippians in person again so that he can continue working for their progress and joy in Christ. But, as we see in the rest of the letter, Paul's expectation of being released from prison fell short of an absolute certainty. He knew he could face a death sentence. So, as a good spiritual father, Paul wants the Philippians to thrive in the faith and remain focused on their mission, whether he comes to them or not. And so he tells them, in verse 27, only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. In other words, whatever happens, whether I come to see you or I'm absent, live in a way that commends the gospel, a life worthy of the gospel. Now, what does living a life worthy of the gospel look like? Well, that's something that Paul will uh, flesh out and come back to in the rest of the letter. Uh, in fact, living a life worthy of the gospel is the main theme, the main point of the book of Philippians. 
But the main idea that Paul puts forward in our passage this morning is this, that we live a life worthy of the gospel by having unity in the gospel and by having confidence in the gospel. We live a life worthy of the gospel by having unity in the gospel and having confidence in the gospel. So unity and confidence. So let's consider these things in turn. Let's start with unity. Look at verse 27 again. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or I'm absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. So Paul wants the Philippians to stand firm, whether he comes to them or not. And in order to do that, they need to be united in the gospel. Or as it's, he says at the end of that verse, united in the faith of the gospel. And I think this unity has two aspects that we, that we see here in this passage. First aspect of that unity is a unity of purpose. You see, the Philippian church had come into existence because they heard the message that Paul preached, the gospel of Christ. They heard of God's mercy and grace for sinners in Jesus Christ. That God has sent His Son into the world. That God's Son, though He was in very nature God, became a man and suffered and died on a cross in the place of sinners. That He had risen again. That sinners receive God's forgiveness and acceptance not on account of their own actions or social status or religious status, but by faith alone in Christ. And having heard this message, the Philippians embraced it. They believed it. And spreading this message became their mission their purpose. So Paul is simply reminding them of what they already know is their purpose. Holding fast to the gospel as their faith and proclaiming the gospel so that it becomes the faith of others. Now, earlier in the letter, Paul commended the Philippians for their partnership in the gospel. They, overall, they're one of the best churches that we see in the, in the New Testament, right? And they knew what they were supposed to do and they were doing it. So why does then Paul feel like he needs to remind them of this one more time? Well, Paul had heard reports that certain problems were brewing in the Philippian congregation. There was envy, rivalry, selfish ambition, pride, grumbling, maybe even theological or doctrinal, doctrinal errors, sinful passions, and sharp disagreements. And all of these things were undermining their focus on their mission, and therefore their unity in the gospel. And if you think about it, those are some of the same issues that can undermine unity in churches today. Even good churches. Even Presbyterian churches. Even PCA churches. Churches can get distracted from their mission of proclaiming the gospel to the world around them because their members are fighting with each other. Now, it's okay for Christians to have convictions, to have open discussions about those convictions with other Christians, and even to disagree with other Christians regarding those convictions. 
But it's not okay to make those convictions so central that they distract from the mission of the church. And it's not okay to treat brothers and sisters unkindly because we disagree with them. So this is where the second aspect of unity comes to play. And that's the unity of posture. Unity of posture. Now I'm not going to spend a ton of time here um, because upcoming chapters and sermons will deal with this more fully. But Paul reminds the Philippians that they must be united, he says, in one spirit, with one mind, right? So they, they ha need to have a posture, a certain kind of ethic or attitude that flows from the gospel. And this posture is toward God, toward self, toward others in the church, and toward the world. It's a posture of humility, patience, for forgiveness, repentance, forbearance, grace, love. If you remember Paul's prayer at the beginning of the letter of, of, of the beginning of the letter, he prays that their love may abound more and more with knowledge and discernment. Then in chapter 2, he's going to tell them to do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. But rather, in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Paul knows that in order to live a life worthy of the gospel, we need not, not only to know the truth of the gospel, but also to live out the posture of the gospel. So brothers and sisters, are you working to promote unity in the gospel in this church? These days and in this environment, there are so many things that can pull us in different directions. Sinful things, good things, and even neutral things. How to respond to cultural trends. How to respond to the govern governor's mandates. Who to vote for. How to educate our children. What would it look like for you, for all of us, to prioritize the purpose of the church over the things that you individually are passionate about, that we are passionate about? What would it look like for us to seek the interest of others and not our own? If we are to live a life worthy of the gospel, we need to have unity in the purpose of the gospel and in the posture of the gospel. There's another thing Paul says that we need in order to live a life worthy of the gospel, and that is confidence. Let's pick up in the middle of verse 27. He says, That I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel, and not frightened in anything by your opponents. When Paul talks about their opponents, he's probably thinking about the Roman authorities opposed to the preaching of the gospel and the establishment of churches. Or perhaps he's thinking about religious groups that were hostile to the message of Christ, such as the, the Jews or the Judaizers, that is, those who were within the church but promoting Jewish practices as tests of true Christianity. Or perhaps he had in mind simply unbelieving and hostile families and relatives. Whoever Paul is thinking about, it's clear that believers in Philippi had opponents in that as a social and religious minority, they were vulnerable to scorn, abuse, persecution, perhaps even extinction. 
So this certainly would have caused them to be anxious and fear for their lives. But Paul says that one way to live a life worthy of the gospel is by not being frightened in anything by our opponents. Now, I don't think Paul is saying that Christians will never or ought never experience psychological, physical fear in in the face of opposition or danger. Rather, I think he's saying that Christians should not be controlled by those fears. And that they should not retaliate towards their opponents. How can Christians do that? in the face of danger. Well, remember what what Paul said, those memorable words that Paul gave us in the previous section. He said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Paul was in prison. Paul was suffering for the cause of Christ. How can Paul say that? Well, he could say that because he knew that in Christ, his salvation was certain. He knew that his sins, all of his sins, were forgiven. He knew that he was justified before God. That he was assured of God's love. He knew that he would rise again just like Christ did. He knew that whether in life or in death, he belonged to Christ. And so the same was true for the Philippians. And you know what? The same is true for us. Brothers and sisters, in Christ, your salvation is sure. All your sins are forgiven. Before God, you are righteous. God loves you. You will rise again. Whether in life or in death, Christ is yours. I've been recently um, reading Harry Potter, the first book. I know I'm late to the game, Um, and I have, I don't really know what the storyline is in the the rest of the books, but I'm in the first book, and if you've read the book, which I would assume that that you have, or you're familiar with it, uh, Hagrid picks up um, Harry and takes him to, um, to a place called Gringotts. Because that's where Harry, Harry's family wealth is stored. And it's interesting because Gringotts is this place where like everything is safe. There's no way no one can get in. Right? Now, please don't tell me that later on someone breaks in and steals the stuff. Because, and then also my, my illustration doesn't work. But... <laughs> But in Christ, Christ is like Gringotts, right? He's got our salvation protected. We belong to Him. And so any earthly danger from our opponents, as scary as it may be, pales in comparison to the comforts and the blessings that are ours because of our union with Christ. And therefore, we can face our opponents with confidence. Because really, they can't take anything of eternal value from us. Do you really believe that? I really believe that. How would we act differently if we, li- if we really believe that is true. It's 
It's interesting what Paul says next in verse 28. He says, this is a clear sign to them, to their opponents, of their destruction, but of your salvation, and that from God. I don't think this translation here is, is the best. Uh, the, the ESV kind of gives the impression that our opponents clearly know that they are going to be judged by God and therefore destroyed. Uh, I don't want to go into the details of the Greek, but the, the, the dative is a bit um, is unclear. It's a bit ambiguous. And as we know, not all opponents of the gospel know clearly that they are going to be condemned. In fact, many of them believe the complete opposite. They believe that we are crazy, that we are going to be condemned for being so narrow-minded and exclusive in our belief in Christ. I think what Paul is saying here is that sometimes when opponents of the gospel see Christians united in their proclamation of the gospel and united in their loving posture towards one another in the world and not being frightened by their opponents, that brings conviction of sin. They start to wonder whether they are in the wrong. Whether perhaps this Jesus that Christians talk so much about is real. And whether he's really mighty to save. And some of them end up turning from unbelief. From unbelief to faith in Christ. Actually, that's something Jesus said that would happen. And he prayed for that. In John 17, he prayed to the Father that his disciples may all so that the world may believe that he was sent by the Father. And that should be our prayer too. That we are so united in the gospel. That we are so confident in the power of the gospel to save us and to save others that even our worst enemies are drawn to repentance and faith in Christ. So we can have confidence in the face of opposition. But Paul says one more thing about having confidence in the gospel. Pick up there in verse 29. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake, engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had, and now here I still have. As counterintuitive as this may sound, God has granted to his children, to his people, not only faith in Christ, but also sufferings for his sake. When we as Christians experience opposition and suffering, we are tempted to believe that we're doing something wrong or that or we start to question whether or if he's real, whether he's with us or for us. But Paul says that the sufferings we experience for the sake of Christ are a sign, a sign of our salvation, the salvation we've received from God. Now, let, let's be careful here. We, we need to recognize that as many times as Christians, we are the object of opposition and we undergo suffering because we're jerks. And because we bring it on ourselves. But Paul is not talking about that kind of suffering. He's talking about our sufferings for the sake of Christ. Paul says that the sufferings are part of the, the package of salvation. 
God has given us a gift that it's all blessing, but within those blessings, some hard things, some things are hard to swallow. We get to believe in Christ and we get to suffer for him. This is nothing new. This is something that Jesus himself said. He said that the Christian life would be costly. He said, if, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and for the Gospels will save it. Paul and Barnabas told the, told the believe, believers in, uh, in the book of Acts, chapter 14, that through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. And then Paul tells Timothy also in 2 Timothy chapter 3, all who desire to live a godly life in Jesus Christ will be persecuted. So brother and sister, I don't like suffering. Regardless of whether it's for the, for the sake of Christ or because I'm a jerk. And I'm sure you don't like it either. But in God's providence, he has designed it as part of the benefits that we get through union with Christ. Because you know what? When we suffer for Christ, we are drawn closer to him. We get to experience somewhat what he experienced for us. We are conformed to his image. We are given an opportunity to, to honor him and to show his matchless worth. We even get to uh, enjoy fellowship with each other through suffering. As Paul says there in verse 30, he says that the Philippians are engaged in the same conflict that you saw, that they saw he had, and now hear that he still has. We get to fellowship with each other and with all of our brothers and sisters around the world as we suffer for Christ. Sufferings will not be forever. Just as Christ was humiliated and then exalted, we will also experience humiliation, but we will be exalted with him. And therefore, we can be confident that as we experience suffering for, Christ, for the sake of Christ, of the salvation that, that God has granted us in the gospel. So this passage calls us to live a life worthy of the gospel of Christ. Live a life worthy of the gospel of Christ. Some Christians might associate that call with a variety of behaviors. Perhaps, on the one hand, retreating from society to create our own little Christian society, or boycotting um, unchristian businesses. Or on the other hand, perhaps renewing society, transforming the culture, putting Christians in high positions of power to ensure that the laws of the nation reflect biblical values. And those things, any of those things, may be appropriate at times and to a certain degree. But the picture that Paul gives us in this passage is much more, much less glamorous or grand. According to Paul, what does it look like to live a life worthy of the gospel? Well, it looks like something that the common public can do by the grace of God and by the power of the Holy Spirit. It looks a lot like keeping calm and carrying on. We keep calm by having confidence in the gospel in the face of opposition and suffering. Because we know that God has begun a good work in us and that he will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. And we carry on by seeking unity in the purpose 
in the, in the posture of the gospel so that the message of Christ might go forth. So brothers and sisters, whatever happens, whether things continue to be sweet and calm or we're attacked, keep calm and carry on. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the gift of your son. Thank you for the salvation that we have in him, for the confidence that we have that our lives are in your hand, whatever happens. Help us, Lord, to be united as a church in the proclamation of this precious message of salvation. Help us, Lord, to glorify you and to live a life worthy of the gospel. In Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. Please stand and join us in our closing prayer.
blessing. But whatever gain we had, we count as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, we count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, our Lord. For his sake, we are willing to suffer the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that we may gain Christ and be found in him. God bless you. We'll see you next week. Thank you.